The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Updates in Medical Management in Pediatric Cardiomyopathy, which is hosted today by the Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation. My name is Cindy Andrake, and I am the Family Support Manager here at CCF. If you're new to our webinars, we want to extend a warm welcome to you. If you've joined us previously, we want to welcome you back, and we're really glad that you could join us today. We hope you find today's presentation helpful and informative, uh, but before I introduce you to our presenter, I'd like to review some housekeeping information. If at any time during the presentation you have technical issues, uh, you can type your concerns into the chat window, which is on your control panel, and we will do our best to address them. If you should have any audio issues or difficulty hearing, you should be able to switch from your computer screen to a call-in phone number to correct the audio. In order to provide the highest quality webinar session and to avoid any background noise, you can um, we, we have put everybody in the listen only mode during the presentation. Questions are encouraged during the presentation and we'll reserve the last 10 to 15 minutes of the hour to answer them. Please submit your questions via the question box located on the control panel of the right hand side of your screen. And I will read them to our presenter at the conclusion of our presentation. If the control panel is preventing you from seeing the screen, you can always hide it by clicking on the small orange arrow at the top of the control panel. Last, we are recording today's webinar presentation and we'll post it on our YouTube channel, CCF Heart Kids, for anyone that would like access to the recording later. With housekeeping reminders complete, it is my sheer pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Beth Kaufman. Dr. Beth Kaufman is the Director of Pediatric Cardiomyopathy Program, attending physician in the Pediatric Advanced Cardiac Therapies Program at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital, and Clinical Associate Professor of Pediatrics at Stanford University. She has been practicing pediatric cardiomyopathy, heart failure, and heart transplantation for 15 years after she completed pediatric training at Johns Hopkins and pediatric cardiology and heart failure transplant subspecialty training at Columbia University. Dr. Kaufman was attending and director of pediatric cardiomyopathy at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia for eight years prior to her current appointment at Stanford in 2013. She has held leadership positions in the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplant and has been an active member of collaborative research projects related to pediatric cardiomyopathy, mechanical support and heart transplant, including the Pediatric Cardiomyopathy Registry, Action, and the Pediatric Heart Transplant Study. Dr. Kaufman is currently involved in multi-center research related to sudden cardiac death risk predictors for pediatric HCM, MRI evaluation for progression of cardiomyopathy and Duchenne mus muscular dystrophy, and investigation of non-cardiac modifiers of pediatric heart failure. Her other interest includes palliative care, shared decision-making, and ethics related to caring for children with heart failure. I want to thank Dr. Kaufman for being with us today. We're thrilled that she could join us. Um, and at this point, I am going to turn the screen over to Dr. Kaufman, and she will begin her presentation. Great. So, thank you so much. Um, let's see. Okay, one moment. Let's go back on. Can everybody, uh, is my screen visualized okay there, Cindy? Um, yeah, if you want, can you just enlarge it? Um, I'm at max in my view. Okay. Um, okay, I think, all right, um, I think if, that, if you're at max, let me just see. All right, I think that's fine. I'm in my slideshow mode. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, I must say this is my, I'm so happy to be presenting uh, for the Children's Karmapi Foundation. Uh, it's really near and dear to my heart. Um, this is my first time doing a webinar, so please excuse any awkwardness. I'm, I'm used to seeing the people I'm, I'm talking with. I have great empathy now for radio show host. Well, let's get started. So um, today's um, talk really is going is not going to be an introductory talk for a cardiomyopathy. I'm really calling it Cardiomyopathy 202. There's wonderful webinars online at the CCF Foundation website that goes through all of the basics and descriptions of all the different types of cardiomyopathy. But what we thought it would be fun and interesting to do is on the theme of updates is really I thought to discuss what are the themes of current investigations. 
uh, what's going on kind of behind the scenes when you go to your doctor's office uh, for a cardiac checkup. And I sort of, um, of thinking about this, I think there's kind of like three major themes in our current era investigation of cardiomyopathy. And that's really identification of the genetic etiology of cardiomyopathies, characterization of modern era natural history of disease, and also a search for prognostic markers. I'll also, of course, touch a little bit on advances in heart failure therapies. So as I'm sure all of you know, um, cardiomyopathy is more than just having a big heart, right? Because the heart can be dilated or it could be abnormally thickened. And really, cardiomyopathy is just a general term for heart muscle abnormality. And there's many, many different types, as you all know. So I can't really give, you know, I can fill up many hours talking about the specifics of each one, but I'll talk about mainly um, updates related to dilated and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the most common. Um, I do want to start, though, with making sure we're all on the same page with some of the, um, the terms that we typically use in the field. And most importantly, to realize that genotype cardiomyopathy and having heart failure are not the same thing. Genotype is really talking about what is the genetic change that results in an abnormal gene product. It doesn't talk about anything on how the patient's actually affected by it. Cardiomyopathy means that there actually is an abnormality of the heart muscle and or function of the heart. Whereas transition to heart failure is really a dynamic process and refers to the inability of the heart to keep up with the body's metabolic demands, no matter what is causing the problem. So we'll start off first just talking mainly about cardiomyopathy in general. And no talk would be complete without mentioning the Pediatric Cardiomyopathy Registry Study, which really um, formed the basis of, 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 um, of characterization of the field of pediatric cardiomyopathy over several years. Um, this was funded by the National Institutes of Health, uh, it started in 1994, and it wound up enrolling 3,500 pediatric patients at the time of diagnosis of a cardiomyopathy. And these patients then had annual follow-up. Um, and there have been many studies that came out of the Pediatric Cardiomyopathy Registry. And I'll just mention just a couple, which I think were important of setting the foundation of where we are now. So again, the key thing is to kind of keep in mind the time period. This was a long time ago now. It was from 1990 to 2008. It was no longer enrolling. But during that period, it allowed us to sort of characterize the relative proportions of kids presenting with dilated cardiomyopathies versus hypertrophic, restrictives, and other types. And so there was an incidence of about 1.13 cases per 100,000 children. And that's important to get intention. Um, we were also able to characterize how really you can't group all the cardiomyopathies together. That outcomes, as you can see on the chart on the right, are very different uh, based on what your actual type of cardiomyopathy is. Um, even further to that, and again, you will have all of these slides uploaded, so I, I'm not going to go through all the data on all the slides, but basically also giving them to you as a resource. Um, just as an example, there's so many different causes or underlying etiologies, for instance, of dilated cardiomyopathy that presents in infancy and childhood. And the treatment and prognosis is very variable. And that also has been demonstrated looking at these cohorts from the PCMR registry. And all the different lines here represent different etiologies of dilated cardiomyopathy that presented. And if you look here, and um, it's showing that if you just look at the dark line there, just patients who have dilated cardiomyopathy when you can't find a related underlying syndrome or specific genetic diagnosis, at that point in time, and that's an important factor, keep in mind, at that point in time, the five-year survival without heart transplant was about 50%. And you could see how it varied really depending on what the underlying etiology was. Now, again, it is it's worth a pause here that so many of these studies in these graphs that you see use as an outcome measure death or transplant. Now, I don't know if anyone on the line here listening to me has a child or a relative who's gone through heart transplant, but absolutely, it is nowhere near the same thing as someone who has died or lost. Um, you can live very, very healthy, well, full lives as a transplant recipient, but that's you know, the, the current status of what's used as an outcome measure. We'll talk about some advances from that, but please take that as, as is. <laughs> I don't support that, but, but that is the, the standard outcome measure. Um, if we look at a little bit deeper at this group of kids who had the dilated cardiomyopathy of unknown causes, 
what's really interesting is something I've definitely observed clinically is that in a pretty large number of patients, there were 740, 22% actually recovered within two years of diagnosis. We often focus on sort of the negative aspects of it, of who needs transplant, who has died, who has had events, but it's quite remarkable that 20% on medical management, we assume, right, will actually demonstrate recovery, even starting from a very poor function place. And that's something we definitely observe. Um, I thought I would speak a moment about left ventricular non-compassion karmopathy as an example of what's changed from the time of that PCMR cohort. So really, um, this LVNC is, um, is a kind of a troublesome form of karmopathy because it's really hard to describe. It was first uh, noted in 2006, but these were by patients who actually presented quite sick. And it was found that they had these increased ridges to peculations in their heart muscle. We think maybe it represents um, an abnormality in development of the heart, though the exact mechanism is still unclear. And the thing is that you could be completely asymptomatic and totally fine and have normal heart function, yet on imaging, you have these increased ridges in your heart. And in other patients, your heart can really look like that of a dilated heart or of a hypertrophic heart. And so it's kind of unclear, really, what is uh, trying to group LVNC patients all together? There are certainly some that are associated with other syndromes, as you can see on the right side of my screen, where it says Barth syndrome, to Tabasin mutations and stuff, but it really is such a heterogeneous group. And in this study, looking at those cohort of LVNC patients that were reported to the pediatric cardiomyopathy registry, it was a 5% prevalence. But really, all of the patients that now are currently being detected due to improved imaging techniques, who are asymptomatic, who actually don't have any symptoms, those patients aren't represented in this cohort. And so it's a little bit hard to extrapolate sort of what if you look online and see sort of these older publications, so this is from 2015, of really, well, what does that mean for my child if, say, your child had an innocent heart murmur, wound up getting an echo, and was told that they have LV non-compaction, though everything else is isolated, that everything else with the heart is fine. So this is the current area of interest in our field. And if you find that you sometimes uh, read different things online or getting different messages, it's because there really is uh, a lot of unknown of what degree of LV non-compaction really is a problem and which are likely to um, transition into symptomatic cardiomyopathies versus others where it's just a finding. Um, another example of cardiomyopathies that's changed, I would say, since the times of PCMR cohort are those with restrictive cardiomyopathy. So, and there's two recent reports, and again, you'll see as my slides go on, I've given you a lot of references and just sort of the headlines of these different articles that I think are important and representative, and then you can use them um, if you want more information later. Um, so there's some current efforts really looking at the more current era of management for pediatric restrictive cardiomyopathy. Because if you look at these graphs down on the right side of the screen, you can see in the red lines, the historical cohort, they did awful and they were presenting very symptomatic. This was prior to screening that was happening. And so children were being picked up late perhaps and having symptoms and therefore their outcomes were, were quite poor. Looking at a more current um, management style where the patients are followed quite closely because we're aware of the risk of progression of the disease with the development of pulmonary hypertension, where we know it can run in families, so we sort of screen family members, and where uh, while the earliest uh, management strategy was typically as soon as making the diagnosis to automatically look for heart transplant, there are some centers who actually follow the patients medically if they're doing well and asymptomatic and have a reassuring hemodynamics. And so these are two recent studies that are starting to look at and compare sort of older styles of management with current. That it's very hard to actually kind of do research and have evidence uh, because you can't really compare. We can't go back to the past. And we also drive our own behavior. Um, and so again, just sort of a way to think if you're looking and, and reading different articles and seeing different mention of things online, to always put that in context of, of what is the design of the study? How much are we as a medical practitioners reporting on our own behavior in the field versus what's actually changing in the patients? Um, so, and then modern era, the pediatric cardiomyopathy registry is doing some exciting work. Look 
looking at a prospective study of almost 500 kids uh, who are focused with dilated or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, looking at different blood samples, trying to find what are some biomarkers? What is something that we can follow, say in the blood or with imaging, to kind of be able to use to predict how these kids do? Who develops heart failure? Who winds up having arrhythmias? And so this is a pretty powerful study in that it's longitudinal and it's looking at some established biomarkers. Maybe people have heard of BMP, B-type natriuretic peptide or troponins. Those are very classic adult heart failure biomarkers but also looking for really novel disease-specific uh, markers as well, such as looking for markers of cardiac fibrosis and stuff. So just an example of really one of the areas of research that's being advanced currently is looking for different biomarkers of progression of, from cardiomyopathy to heart failure, which I showed in that early slide. Now, this scientific statement from the American Heart Association really is the point of, of arrival for us as pediatric cardiomyopathy doctors. Um, the fact that the American Heart Association, one of the you know, biggest cardiac um, societies, has uh, put together a group of uh, clinicians um, to really put a statement uh, about the specifics, really acknowledging this is a pediatric specific diagnosis and all of the nuances of it. And the aim of this statement was really set to focus on the diagnosis and classification of cardiomyopathy, because that's really then the way you can go forward and kind of outline what are the research priorities for this field, what should be funded for research, to how do you improve clinical outcomes and better quality of life. And of note, one of the councils that really um, helped write this statement was the Council on Genomics and Precision Medicine, really outlining full acknowledgement of the huge genetic etiology of cardiomyopathies. Now, this is already, this is an old slide, but just as an example of there's so many different uh, genetic variants that have been identified with causing different types of cardiomyopathy, and that there's often overlap between them. Uh, you could sometimes have in the same family the same uh, genetic mutation, genetic change that causes, say, one person in the family to look like they have a thickened heart in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but maybe other people in the same family, their hearts would be dilated. And other ways that some people, one family can have a mutation and have dilated cardiomyopathy in their family, another different family may have the same mutation and wind up having hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So that's another really prominent area of research is all this genetic discovery of really looking for, really trying to describe as many different etiologies, genetic etiologies of cardiomyopathy that run in families or that appear isolated as possible. So this is just an example of that area of research that's currently ongoing. And with that, um, there's also clinical practice guidelines and statements that a genetic evaluation of families, whether you're uh, children or adults, presented with cardiomyopathy is now standard of care and that it is covered by insurance, it should be protected, that this is now a part of routine clinical practice to undergo genetic evaluation to look for a diagnosis. And this is now at our highest level of recommendations from the American uh, societies as well as European societies. Um, there's uh, been development of genetic testing algorithms specific to kids, and again, I'll leave this screen for your reference, basically indicating um, who is the appropriate person in the family member to get genetic testing, and then who uh, should be seen for screening. And really, it's this attention on screening at-risk first-degree family members that, again, has really proved a significant advancement in the field, uh, because earlier detection of disease is better. You don't want to wait for someone to have very bad symptoms and already be in that state of heart failure rather than to catch them at much earlier stages where they have cardiomyopathy, but perhaps they're still very well, they're healthy and compromised, and you can institute preventative strategies. Um, and we'll talk more about that. This slide I put in is also an example of current research strategies that we have very large administrative and clinical databases. I mentioned pediatric cardiomyopathy registry as one, but there's a very large actually administrative billing database called the Pediatric Health Information System that captures about 50 pediatric hospitals and kind of linking the information in that database, which is based like diagnoses and such, hospital admissions, with some of the clinical databases. So for it, just as an example here, the study used the registry of transplant recipients. So looking at those who actually underwent heart transplant, by doing a linkage of these databases, we're really 
able to extend the questions, the investigative capabilities of these. And this is an example of a study looking at children who had mitochondrial disease as the cause of their cardiomyopathy, who were selected for heart transplant, who underwent heart transplant, and what happened to them. Um, so again, just using this article as an example of the current era, the types of research that's being done using these large databases uh, and these mining and data processing efforts that are relatively new and are being used in many different areas of, of medicine. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit more now to talk a little bit more specifically about therapies and about uh, really trying to prevent the transition from genotype to cardiomyopathy. Uh, really, the, the, uh, our goal, our success as a field would be, can we institute therapy at this point in time when we know a genetic cause of cardiomyopathy? Can we actually prevent the development of cardiomyopathy? Can we replace the gene? And we'll talk about that. Um, um, though, for the most part, really, all of our therapies are really focused at this point here of trying to prevent the transition from just having abnormalities, cardiomyopathy, to actually treating heart failure and then trying to mitigate the effects of heart failure. Now, we know, though, that really the presentation of cardiomyopathy in the young and the presentation of heart failure in kids can be really challenging, and really different than that in adults. Kids can be completely asymptomatic and then can have perhaps a sudden illness and what you think might have been a cold or a stomach flu, you go to the doctor and it's like, oh my God, it's the heart. You would have never have thought that. And this story is very common for children presenting with heart failure. Sometimes they can have palpitations or seizures or little kids can sort of have spells, and this could be the way that they show that they're having heart rhythm abnormalities. Then we have exercise intolerance that sometimes can be quite gradual. So all of a sudden, well, your child who really used to be into soccer, well, now it's boring, you know, and now he just doesn't want to go to practice anymore and kind of seems to lose interest in the activity. But that's because kids are smart and they don't like doing things that don't feel good. And so if they're finding it harder to participate and harder to keep up and they don't feel good, well, then they may they just say that they don't want to do it anymore. Um, sometimes kids could just have nonspecific fatigue and maybe, you know, particularly some teenagers, oh, you're, you're just being lazy um, rather than really being physically limited. Cough, respiratory symptoms, it could be diagnosed with asthma, which is so much more common than cardiomyopathy, and failure to thrive of really having a lot of uh, stomach symptoms, of not eating well, not having good appetites, not being able to hold on to waking. These are all very typical presentations of cardiomyopathy and heart failure in the young that are different from adults. And um, most of all, really, that sometimes that acute heart failure, the first time realizing you have heart failure, can really be delayed in diagnosis because they seem much more likely to be a common pediatric illness. Um, having high fevers or, as I mentioned, stomach complaints, it's much more common to have appendicitis. I've had some patients, then they get an x-ray before they go in for surgery to get their appendix removed and they're found to have a big heart. So this is some of the challenges that we have in our field of, of really for early recognition of cardiomyopathy in young, but it's definitely getting out there and it's a lot more recognized. Um, and I think that's one of the powers of screening. And that brings us to this diagram here, which describes these stages of heart failure and therapies that have been described by the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology. And really pay attention to the top part of the, the diagram there about the different stages. Now, it's really this focus on those who have stage A, where someone could be at risk of having cardiomyopathy and heart failure, but they're actually totally fine. And so these are the patients who perhaps have relatives with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, for instance, or those people who are known to have a genetic risk, that they carry the family mutation. And it's attention on these stage A populations that has really changed, I think, the field, seeing like, hey, this is a population of people that they should be getting cardiac screens. Insurance should pay for this, because by early detection, we can then start different preventative therapies to try to prevent the progression to having symptoms, which is stage C, where you have heart disease, but you've had symptoms of heart failure, and then stage D, where you're really needing you know, um, intensive care unit, care and ventricular assist device, and much higher therapies. So um, many families who are in cardiomyopathy clinic or healthy, um, healthy kids, um, sometimes a lot of our clinics and programs, they're, they're called heart failure clinics. So we have a heart failure program. 
what an awful name, right? I mean, no one wants to be told that like, oh, that they have failure. Um, but if this is where it stems from, that, well, well, no, you actually have stage A heart failure, which means you have a risk, though you actually are totally fine. And we try to change that nomenclature. And as I sort of alluded to, there's been some positives to it being kind of instituted in this way in order to get um, attention to have having a risk for cardiomyopathy that you can intervene on, that you can screen for. Um, however, it does have that negative side to it that often the shorthand term for cardiomyopathies are being described as having heart failure. And that's not really true in the sense of having that physiologic heart failure. Um, so. Um, Treatment for um, and dilated cardiomyopathy is the most common form of, of cardiomyopathy that actually cause systolic heart failure. So when your, your body has a hard time of uh, uh, circulating the blood to meet all the body's demands. And all this is based on these adult guidelines that were demonstrated in the other slide. We have this concept of reverse ventricular remodeling. Basically, you're trying to get the heart to stop dilating, stop enlarging. And this is being caused by a whole neurohormonal activation scheme. And so the medications that we use, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, aldosterone blocker, is to try to change the way the body is reacting to the stress of having an abnormal heart muscle and have it respond in a more beneficial way. So kind of that analogy that, um, that if you have a horse who has a very heavy load and you still have miles to go, is it better to beat the horse and make it work harder and harder? No, it's better to unload, take the, the load off the horse, let the horse rest, and then you'll be able to achieve the distance that you want to go. So that's sort of a, a common concept we use in the treatments that we use. Of course, we manage symptoms, um, trying to relieve congestion when the body is holding on to all this extra fluid, and that's called a diuresis. Um, Lasix, diuretic, very common forms of diuretics that are used in adults and kids all the same way. And then, of course, IV medications that we call inotropes to really try to help support the circulation. And when that's not enough, there's a whole new field of mechanical assist devices for advanced heart failure, which we will not cover in this talk. Another aspect of cardiomyopathy is really controlling rhythm problems. And again, there's many different medications to try to do that and also some devices. But let's talk about kids, right? Because as I was saying that, you know, pediatric dilated cardiomyopathy is different from adults due to the many different reasons that are causing it. Um, that being said though, it's very hard to then do trials on pediatric patients because they're so different from one another. And also it's still relatively rare compared to the adults uh, who have coronary disease or even genetic forms of cardiomyopathies, our population is still so small and it's very hard to do uh, appropriate trials to try to really find out is one medication is treatment better than another do kids respond the same way to these therapies we're using in adults and so most of the guidelines for how we treat kids who have cardiomyopathies is really just based on anecdotal you know by the experience of experts in the field um, there has been a, one large clinical trial uh, historically called the Carvedilol trial, and I don't know if anyone on the phone who actually participated in that. But what's really exciting is we currently have an active pediatric heart failure drug trial called Panorama HF. And I'll go in and speak about this a bit uh, since it's actively enrolling. And
advancements from the pharmaceutical industry. There's a statement put out in 2017, again by the AHA, which holds a lot of weight, um, for the management of cardiomyopathies associated with neuromuscular diseases. And some of these are familial and can, are considered genetic diseases as well. They just also affect the body. And um, the paraprojic muscular dystrophy group is a parent um, 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 initiated foundation similar to Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation, I think would be a great liaison. I don't know if any people on the phone are affected with cardiomyopathy due to neuromuscular issues, but they recently put on a healthcare provider summit, and I have just a couple of slides here from Dr. McDonald really illustrating the advances in current clinical trials for, for DMD. Because what I really think is so important, this model really will apply to so many different types of pediatric cardiomyopathies that are caused by a single genetic change focusing on trying to correct what is the, the impact of the genetic change. Um, can we correct the impact of that? How do we limit the progression of disease? And this is just an example of the multiple trials that are being done to really target at the genetic level of trying to reproduce dystrophin. How do we get it into the cells? And they're just starting to have some cardiac specific trials. And again, just I would keep my eye on this uh, because I really think there is so much relevance to all different types of genetically caused, single gene cause of, of cardiomyopathy. And so really just in the past 10 years, the amount of advancements in technology is very impressive and very excited about this. So just um, a moment on some hyper updates related specifically to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. As a reminder, you know, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is unexpected explained LV hypertrophy and similar to dilated is caused by many different reasons. There's primary uh, genetic changes in the sarcomere, in the, in the heart muscle cells themselves, the components of it, but also different genetic syndromes, mitochondrial syndromes, metabolic. And what we do know from studies is that the outcomes and what influences the outcomes with children with HCM is again dependent on what's causing it. And this is just an example of a study that looked at all these different risk factors and how they changed based on what was the underlying cause. And this was showing up, again, what is the probability of unfortunately dying or having needing a heart transplant two years after diagnosis. And it's just so variable. Um, we have learned a bit from these long-term population studies. There was a, an Australian childhood cardiomyopathy study that now has a 15 years follow-up. And, um, and we've been able to learn a lot about following this cohort um, long-term. We've been able to look at subsets of children who have Noonan syndrome and how they're doing specifically compared to children with other forms of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And we're learning a lot about that over time, looking through these different long-term databases. Uh, but what's most important and, and what scares us the most about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is really the risk of sudden cardiac death. And we really only know what are risks um, in the adult population. And those are listed here. Has you had a cardiac arrest and thankfully survived? Are you having significant ventricular risk? Is there a family history of sudden death due to HCM? Are you having unexplained fainting spell? And do you have severe hypertrophy and an inability of, to have a normal response to exercise? But really only currently, it's only been thought that exercise restriction from highly competitive sports and an ICD implant to actually provide uh, electrical shock therapy if your heart is in an arrhythmia, these have really been the only effective therapies against sudden cardiac death. We want to treat with medications to try to prevent it, but that has not been proven to do so. And so the adults have actually put together a risk calculator. It's an app on your phone, but it's really only been um, validated in kids who, in people who are really teenagers and older. So really uh, we've been trying to find, is it relevant for our pediatric patients? And it takes into these sort of different, some echo measurements as well as these historical measurements. It's a very straightforward uh, model, as you can see here, <laughs> um, that is just very complicated of what goes into this algorithm. But so there's now ongoing efforts from multiple groups in the pediatric cardiomyopathy community to try to develop what is a risk prediction model for our kids to see who is at risk for these sudden events. There's been a group now of about 1,000 patients from age 1 to 16 and trying using very similar markers to what has been established in adults, but trying to find what is that right equation that kind of can help predict the risk of having an aborted cardiac arrest of having uh, ventricular tachycardias or of having actually sudden cardiac death. And 
just being mindful of the time, I want to make sure we have room for questions. These are just examples of how the risk has been found to really be between 4%, maybe uh, 7%. So overall, much lower than was initially thought when there was a lot of attention of, of, of cases that were coming from very highly specific referral centers. And now in the modern era, we're seeing a much broader, we're screening and finding that there's actually a much larger population of children with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy who do not have it. That being said, though, we absolutely want to try to get better at predicting who is at risk, who would benefit from having implantable cardioverters, a defibrillators to try to prevent that, um, the impact of those events. There's a group um, uh, led by Dr. Seema Mittal from Toronto trying to look at what are the genetic factors in these risk models. And they have found that certain specific genotypes, for instance, associated with the MYH7 gene mutation, do affect outcomes. And so now trying to put together, this is another multi-center cohort study, trying to put together as many patients as we can from many different centers, trying to decide, well, what is that risk calculator for kids? Can we include genetic risk factors for that? And this is currently ongoing. I'll very briefly mention there is a clinical trial um, that I believe is done enrolling, may still be active, called VANISH, trying to look at a medication called Valsartan to try to prevent the progression of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And so it enrolled um, starting from age eight. So it did include a, a somewhat of a pediatric cohort that was skewed towards older age and randomizing. And really it was looking at kids who had kind of like mild hypertrophy, not the most severe phenotypes, and seeing if there was any difference in multiple different outcome measures uh, assessed by cardiac MRI, exercise study, and echo, and different blood tests, and seeing if this medication would make a difference. And so um, maybe next year, if we come back into this talk again, I'll be able to give you some updates on the results of this study. So um, maybe I'll just go for another five minutes or so to make sure we have some time for questions and just very briefly measure of other kinds of therapies. Um, there's electrical type of therapies, which is being looked at in pediatric cardiomyopathy called cardiac resynchronization therapy. So often, um, uh, children and adults may have a pacemaker put in, uh, either associated with a defibrillator or just for conduction abnormalities. And often those sites are put in just at one place in the ventricles called a single pacing site. And when the heart's being kind of triggered to pump just from one location in the heart, it, it kind of results in kind of dyssynchrony of being uh, out of timing and it doesn't give you the most efficient contraction. So sort of putting in two pacemaker sites at the time of pacemaker implied allows the ventricles to move in time with each other in some much more um, effective contraction. And in this study, uh, which is actually in print, was done in our center here, uh, this has been a, an established therapy in adults, but trying to find does it work for kids as well, for it is actually found to have a significant impact on improving symptomatic heart failure in those who underwent uh, placement and had cardiac resynchronization therapy using pacemakers compared to those on just medical therapy. So again, this is something to sort of ask your doctors about if you have dilated cardiomyopathy, symptomatic heart failure, something to be considered, particularly if there are other indications for pacemakers. I was just going to very briefly mention um, um, some work that is being done in Europe on a procedure called pulmonary artery banding to try to help the youngest kids with dilated cardiomyopathy. Now, honestly, this has not been picked up in the States yet. Um, and there may be multiple reasons for that. But just to be inclusive, if there's any um, international folks on the call, or if you hear about this, um, that is mainly seems to be doing in, there were some American sites, but it looked at a group of 70 patients over about 10 years um, who had an, an operation done to try to improve, again, the interaction between the two ventricles in babies uh, who had very weak hearts, who had dilated cardiomyopathy. And certainly some of them did very well, and with the reports the data was out there, was able to have normalization of their left heart function. What I think are some of the challenges and why perhaps this hasn't been instituted as, um, as a common therapy here in the States is that really um, it's taking the risk of taking a, a child who has symptomatic a heart failure, perhaps most of these kids were done several months after diagnosis, they're on IV medications, and they're not getting better. So it's sort of the choice of what's more likely to give them a better outcome of doing an operation to put on this PA band, 
or in centers where ventricular assist devices are available, where heart transplant is available. Now, the outcomes of transplant for infants have dramatically improved. The availability of ventricular assist devices of trying to get children healthier to transplant and have better outcomes has very much improved. And so uh, that's why I presume that depending on what resources are available, where you live, what are the specifics of the actual patients and families' desires and such, that this could be as an alternative to requiring ventricular assist device and transplant. But so it has been well described. It's being led by Dr. Schrantz in in uh, Germany mainly, uh, but this is something uh, to be aware of and to be on the lookout for. Also, very, very briefly, stem cells. And these are cell, these are slides from my dear colleague, Dan Bernstein, who does research in this area, because I know that's very often in the news, I often get this question, what is the role of stem cells for pediatric heart disease? And again, my colleague, uh, he describes it very well in this one slide, opportunities, challenges, and fake news. Um, that there are many challenges of injecting uh, stem cells to try to get new heart cells to grow. Um, it's the types of cells. It's how do you get the cells to where they need to be in the heart? Do the cells last? Our kids need these cells to work for years. Um, do they cause more problems? Do they cause uh, arrhythmias? And what is the safety of it? Um, so I won't have time to go through all of these, but just to say that really that there's been many small studies that are being done and that overall the current state um, that really they have not been shown to have benefit on mortality, on improving heart function, uh, any clinical significant effects. So yes, I would keep an eye out, uh, but I would uh, not recommend at this point of starting uh, with pediatric cardiomyopathy stem cell trials at this point in time until the field is further along with working out in much larger populations the nuances of all the challenges associated with it. Um, so I think um, I will end just with some other thoughts, uh, an area that I think is very important, and that is the psychosocial considerations of pediatric cardiomyopathy. And again, this topic is getting a lot more attention in our field. Um, so often, you know, we have to impose exercise restrictions at the time of new diagnosis. And the impact of that can be immense on a child's identity, um, that we often um, can be too restrictive, and that um, schools are preventing from, from participation, perhaps families are concerned as well, and perhaps we've become much too restrictive with our recommendations. Obesity has become a problem. We need to encourage physical activity, yes, with limits from the most competitive, highest intensity sports. We have to teach our kids how to know their bodies and to rest when they're tired and not overdo it. But it is very, very difficult to regulate, particularly since while we try to control the scenarios and try to restrict and avoid competitive sports and participation in PE class at school, we all know that the basketball game in the neighborhood can be a lot more intense than what's happening in gym class and school. So really to kind of say this is an active issue that's being worked on, particularly in the field of pediatric hypertrophic cardiomyopathy for adults as well, with re-looking really at what is the actual risk of exercise. And stay tuned because this is going to be um, an active area of research in the world of pediatric cardiomyopathy of what really is safe physical activity, what is the impact of restrictions, and how can we better modify it. So, um, oh, and the last point is also thinking of how the impact of cardiomyopathy, that with this whole world of screening, that sometimes we're finding that us as adults may not be as healthy as we think we are, and that at times that cardiomyopathy is being detected in multiple relatives when it wasn't expected, and that also can have a lot of impact on families. So, knowing is power. And so, I'll end with that, just with a big thank you to the Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation. Again, I hope uh, you're as excited as I am in the sense of really there is a lot of opportunity ahead and there's been so much advances in our field and there's many, many more to come. So stay tuned. Thank you, Dr. Kaufman. We really appreciate that you uh, gave us your time today. Uh, we do have a question that someone submitted. If anybody else wants to submit questions, we do have a couple of minutes. Um, this was um, in regard to non-compaction cardiomyopathy. Um, and this person wants to know, is there any hope to find better medication or to heal the disease with genetic in engineering? Mm -hmm. And so if I understand the question, it was specific to LV non-compaction, is that correct? Yes. Yes. So what I would say, the key thing that LV non-compaction in and of itself 
may not be one specific disease. What really is important, I think, is those who have very, if you have a big dilated heart with trabeculations, uh, that what are we doing, you know, what is the hope to uh, try to prevent the dilation and to prevent uh, the heart failure that can come from that? For those who have LV non-compaction in their hearts of very thickened, again, sort of what can we target of, of what's causing the thickening in the heart and how can we better treat that? And, and so this is sort of more of the, the current era of thinking about LV non-compaction, that it's really something to be managed, but it's more so lining up with, uh, there's so many different variations of it because more and more and more, there's so many healthy people walking around who have LV non-compaction in their hearts, but do not actually have heart disease. And so this is really, so absolutely I would be hopeful, but I don't know if we're looking for the gene that's specific to LV non-compaction, the way that specific finding in the heart muscle, but um, the, the gene in general that's causing the disease and the management of these progressions of, of, of the changes in it. Um, I don't know that, you know, I, I hope that answers your, your question, but I would say to stay tuned. This is probably my number one referral of patients I see of LV non-compaction, and it's the hardest to work with because, again, there's just uncertainty with their right. But the key thing is to stay and follow up and engage with your cardiologist who will help guide treatment, management, and what's going on in that individual patient. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, we do have another question. So, uh, in your opinion, what is the most promising therapy ahead um, on the horizon for pediatric cardiomyopathy? Wow, that's a really hard question because again, pediatric cardiomyopathy is at least six different diseases and, um, and they're all very different. Um, so to be quite honest, um, I don't know if, if I can answer that, I would say, what I am quite excited about is um, the role of industry and pharmaceutical companies to really think of our children as a specific population with specific needs. And while that might not be obvious, but that is a really important advancement because then that allows for research funding and, and for the development of therapy, really maybe starting in the pediatric population instead of kind of going through the adult population first. So I would say that Again, just recognition that that children are different and metabolize drugs differently, different from adults. That's probably the one advancement in the field that affects all different types of pediatric cardiomyopathy that is most promising, because that then encourages industry to do pediatric specific trials and for scientists to start thinking about what is different about the pediatric myocardium and heart muscle and how they grow and develop over time. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, so we're really at the end of our hour, um, Dr. Kaufman. So I'm going to end the webinar here. I want to thank you for sharing your time and expertise today. It was really informative, um, and we are so appreciative that you took your time to join us today. Uh, I just want to do a shout out uh, that the Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation website, um, there's a lot of information on there where you can learn about our, our organization as well as other resources. And our, our website, if you're not familiar, is www.childrenscardiomyopathy.org. Um, and also just want to give everyone a reminder that today's webinar will be available on our YouTube channel. And our YouTube channel is called CCF Heart Kids. It's all one word. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. We hope you have a great day and a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Take care now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.